And I think it's really important for listeners to know that most porn consumers do not sexually abuse children, but it's rare that uh, an individual that sexually abuses children is not a porn consumer. Join us this July for our hashtag Stop the Demand campaign as we raise awareness to help stop the demand for pornography and sexual exploitation. We invite you to educate yourselves and others on how the porn industry fuels the demand for exploitation, sex trafficking, objectification, and more. Learn more and get involved in the campaign at ftnd.org forward slash stop. That's ftnd.org forward slash stop. My name is Garrett Augustus Johnson, and you're listening to Consider Before Consuming, a podcast by Fight the New Drug. And in case you're new here, Fight the New Drug is a non-religious and non-legislative organization that exists to provide individuals the opportunity to make an informed decision regarding pornography by raising awareness on its harmful effects using only science, facts, and personal accounts. We want these conversations to be educational, uplifting, and hopeful. As we sit down with experts, influencers, activists, and people with personal accounts, we cover a wide variety of topics that may be triggering to some. You can refer to the episode notes for a specific trigger warning. Listener discretion is advised. Today's episode is with Chris Yaden, the Managing Director of Sapria an organization that exists to liberate individuals and society from child sexual abuse and its lasting impacts. Chris has been working with Sapria since 2015, is a sought-after speaker, and has been invited to give presentations nationally and internationally. During this conversation, we talked about the global issue of child sexual abuse, how porn is connected to child sexual abuse, and how everyone can fight this type of exploitation. With that being said, let's jump into the conversation. We hope you enjoyed this episode of Consider Before Consuming. Thanks for joining us on the podcast today, Chris. Hey, thanks for having me. It's great to be here. We uh, feel very grateful and excited for the opportunity. So, yeah, we love Sapria and what you guys do. And so we are definitely on Team Sapria. That's, that's awesome. It's a, it, it's a joint feeling. Our, our worlds come together in a lot of ways, so we love the work you're doing as well. You're the executive director at Sapria? Yeah, it actually went through a recent shift. I just became the managing director, um, basically split my role so I could spend more time leading publicly in our work to fight child sexual abuse. So brought on someone else to take over some of my responsibilities, and I kept those that related to public leadership. So my title's changed, but uh, this part of my role hasn't. Okay. Well, great. We are grateful you're with us today. Um, Speaking of you and Sapria, I'm curious how you got involved with the organization. Yeah, so it it starts as it often does with the relationship. Our founders uh, were really good friends of mine. Uh, Then we had the opportunity to work together in a startup and had a great experience there. So when it came time for them to start up uh, our charity, uh, they reached out to me to see if I'd be willing to come do it. Uh, it was an easy yes for me for a couple reasons. Uh, one, I knew the quality of our founders. I knew how they would approach it, and I knew they would do it right and provide the resources needed to do it right. And two, sexual abuse is something that had impacted uh, my loved ones. And so even though I wouldn't have considered myself a champion for the cause before, I was sensitive uh, to the cause. So it made it an easy yes for me. I was the first employee for Sapria, and that's a little over seven years ago. Well, that's a cool journey. And I've already mentioned this, but I'll, I'll probably say it a thousand times. Like, we love what you guys do, and we're so grateful for the work you're doing. So it's been seven years that Sapria's been around? Yeah, just over seven. And... A lot of great things have happened in those seven years. We've been able to have a lot of positive impact, measure that impact to make sure we're actually helping people. Uh, We've also been able to develop out some world-class resources. And we're really going through a significant pivot right now to 
uh, from building out our resources and creating quality programs to now scaling those programs. Yeah, that's important. And I think it's kind of relevant to what you said. You speak to scaling the programs because there is a necessity there. Um, people have the trauma and they need help. Referring back to what you mentioned earlier, how you said that some of the people within your circles had been negatively impacted because of sexual abuse. And I think that's the case for a lot of us, whether we know it or not. It's very common, and unfortunately, it's very common to have people in our lives that have been negatively impacted by it. Yeah, and maybe I'll just share a quick experience or story here to highlight this, because a lot of times when people become familiar with the issue of sexual abuse and they hear about its prevalence, which is one in five children in the United States will be sexually abused by age 18, they have a tough time reconciling that because they look in their circles and they they say, well, maybe I know a, a, a person here or there, but I don't that's a lot of people. One in five is a lot of people. I don't know that many people. And this speaks to how taboo the issue is uh, and how difficult it is for survivors to discuss it because of shame. So the experience I had was remarkable. When I started seven years ago working uh, uh, with sexual abuse, I knew of a few of my family members and other loved ones that had experienced it. But it's like people came out of the woodwork. And these were people that I had deep relationships with yeah. that I'd known for a really long time. Some that I would consider some of my closest relationships all of a sudden started disclosing that they were survivors. And I really, I had that moment and it was a transformative moment for me of, is it really that bad? Is it really that taboo? Is there really that much shame that these people I've loved for some of them my entire lifetime and 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 i would say all of all of them for at least many years is it really that bad the shame that they were unwilling to disclose that they were survivors and the answer is yes yeah. until we become a safe person for them so the reality is anybody any of your listeners that are listening to this you have loved ones that were sexually abused you may or may not know it they may or may not be willing to talk to you about it yet but I guarantee you, you have loved ones, yeah. people that are close to you that you care deeply about that are survivors of childhood sexual abuse. Yeah. Thanks for speaking to that. If we look at the barriers to like what stops people from getting help, one of the big barriers is stigmatization. So I think it's really interesting that once you got into this role and like became, a, became more involved, people started opening up to you. I think that kind of speaks to the power of vulnerability. Like once we become a little bit more vulnerable, a little bit more educated, become a safer space, it removes some of that stigmatization so people can open up. Yeah, your statement there of safer space is the critical statement. And that's the only thing that actually changed when, when I started working at Sapria is I went from... Uh, someone in their life that may have been aware of it, but wasn't advocate for it. But when I became an advocate for child sexual abuse survivors and for prevention, I became a safe space. I didn't fundamentally change as a human. I didn't all of a sudden become a better human overnight, but I became that safe space. And, and the, the fact that you brought that up, and this is, again, I think a, a strong commonality between your work in reducing the stigma with porn has a lot of similarities to the work we do in reducing the stigma for sexual abuse survivors to disclose. Both are rooted in shame. And as we make it safe, it allows individuals to, I won't say overcome that shame because I think that's too far of a stretch, but to set that shame aside long enough to, to reach out and say, hey, I, I, would, I would like help. I want to move forward. Yeah. Speaking about you guys scaling there at Sapria, before we talk about kind of how you're scaling to make it more accessible, because again, that's one of the barriers to getting help as well as accessibility to resources. We can speak more to that, but I'm just wondering if you can talk to your areas of focus. Um, from my research, it seems like there's three areas of focus. It's supporting women who have experienced childhood abuse, educating and empowering adults and caregivers um, so that their kids can be safer. 
and then encouraging individuals to take action within their respective communities. Is that accurate? Yeah, those those are our three focus areas. And uh, I would like to go maybe one level above them uh, to what we refer to as our North Star. Our North Star is that we exist to liberate, and that word's really, really important, that liberate word. We exist to liberate individuals and society from child sexual abuse and its lasting impacts. So it's really important to understand that word liberate is critical when you when you think what what's the outcome we're trying to limit liberate society from the the hold that child sexual abuse has on society and the impact it has but we're also trying to help individuals uh, liberate from the lasting impacts on them as survivors and so when you look at those three focus areas that you brought up the first one uh, the healing side where uh, currently we focus on supporting women uh, who have experienced child sexual abuse. I will take note that we are moving towards supporting men as well. We we just opened our funding uh, to uh, fund our, our male services. Um, but for now, it's women. That really focuses on that individual side and liberating that individual and helping that woman who has sexually abused as a child uh, uh, overcome or learn to manage is probably a better way to describe it the lasting impacts of what's most often post-traumatic stress on her life. And so then you move on to the second one, educating, empowering parents and caregivers. This really has a dual, both, both liberating individuals, meaning individual parents, individual families, but then society as a whole, when, when parents engage collectively to change what's going on in society, it's, perhaps the most powerful force for change. Uh, Parents intuitively are really protective of their children. They want what's best for their children. They want the world to be better for their children than when they found it. And those those innate or uh, strong motivations that parents have really have the ability to change things at a societal level. So when we're, we're educating and empowering parents to protect their children, that really hits to both sides of it. And then the last one, which is uh, we're, we're working to drive uh, societal change, uh, specifically by helping individuals take action in their communities. That's more that grassroots societal change approach where well, we're trying to get people to first even talk about it. Yeah. Uh, and be aware of the issue. And then second, be a change maker in their community. That community could be their neighborhood. It could be in their school. It could be in their uh, faith. It could be in their um, uh, workplace. Wherever they have communities, we want them to be a, a change maker. And we want to um, encourage them to take action in those, uh, those communities. Those are all worthy goals. As you're talking about your North Star being to liberate from trauma, is that the goal to liberate from trauma? Yeah, so it, it it's it's twofold again. So for the individual, it's liberating them from the trauma. So th- what, what happens with survivors of child sexual abuse, many survivors, I won't say all, is they internalize the traumatic experience. And because of the shame and stigma that's associated with it, they often deal with it on their own and bury it. Well, their survival systems in their brain and body uh, have to cope with that stress. And they often cope through that stress through behaviors. Some of those behaviors can be maladaptive or or unhealthy. Mm -hmm. Think substance abuse, uh, maybe an eating disorder, uh, or... Uh, dealing with uh, other types of uh, unhealthy or unhelpful uh, coping mechanisms. Right. Another one that comes to mind would be like a social effect when they like they have tendencies to isolate. Right. Absolutely, because that because of the shame and stigma, it it does drive at least that part of their life to isolation, mm-hmm. and that isolation can really take a negative toll on their overall mental health. And so for that individual, it really is about addressing that post-traumatic stress that comes as a result of these uh, uh, maladaptive behaviors and learning to 
remanage that stress. It's not that they won't be triggered by something that reminds them of their perpetrator or perpetration. Yeah. Uh, but if we can reduce the amount of times that they're triggered and increase their capacity to handle those triggers when they come, mm -hmm. it really does change their life. I'll just share two stats. So for one of our healing programs, uh, we've, we've done extensive measurement through third parties. And on average, a woman who goes through that program experiences a 37% reduction in post-traumatic stress wow. and a 45% increase in what are referred to as life satisfaction or well-being indicators. And basically, you know, if you translate those numbers, that what that means is they're getting triggered 37% less by their trauma and their ability to cope with that trauma has improved by 45%. And when you put those two together, you combine those, it it it's it's not a trite statement. It is literally changing their day-to-day -day life and allowing them to move forward uh, with a positive approach to healing and health. Uh, it impacts them. It impacts their relationships, their immediate families, their communities. Right. Yeah, it seems like we've come a long way in regards to how we address trauma, like as a nation and, and as a world. Um, it seems like in the past, we've just tried to manage symptoms. And so I love hearing that stat, that the 45% the stat regarding those, the life satisfaction indicators, because it's showing again that they have the capacity to navigate life despite the trauma that occurred. Yeah, it's it's very empowering, uh, and and that's that's the best word to use. I know that word gets used a lot, uh, but imagine feeling that someone had taken something away from you, and what they took away from you has caused you havoc every day in your life since, mm -hmm. and caused you pain. And then all of a sudden you have these tools and capability to take back that power mm -hmm. and manage through those impacts. It, it, it really is liberating. That's why we use that word. It, it's the best word to describe what, what they experience. And, and to your point as a society, we are getting better at dealing with trauma. I'd say we're, we're getting better at understanding that trauma exists and its impacts. Mm -hmm. uh, I think we still are just at the beginning stages of actually learning how to deal with it. And as a society, we're still dealing with a lot of the secondary issues um, rather than the, the root issues. And we still have some shifts we need to, we need to take there. Yeah. Because Sapria has worked with so many individuals I'm curious if you can speak to some of the variables that are fueling child sexual abuse. Yeah, definitely. Um, this is where I'm going to connect our, our, our work together. I, I, need to, I need to differentiate between the root problem and fuel that gets thrown on the fire to really answer your question. So, so much of what we deal with in terms of secondary issues in our society. Think things like suicide, mental health diagnosis. I mentioned eating disorders earlier, substance abuse. Those often are secondary issues, not always, but often are secondary issues for early childhood trauma. Mm -hmm. And what I mean by that is something happened uh, when that person was in early childhood that was traumatic and didn't get dealt with in a healthy and productive way. And the result is they turn to other things to deal with their pain, to help them uh, move forward in their life, even if that thing that they chose was unhealthy or unproductive. And so um, that's really the root. And child sexual abuse is one of them. It's not the only one. The big three of early childhood trauma are uh, sexual abuse, physical abuse, and neglect. Uh, there are others. I mean, even a child, you know, going through a parent's divorce can be very traumatic or death of a loved one. So it's not that it's only those three, but those are the big three. Okay. Then what happens is in some cases, there are other things that kind of take that fire that's burning and, and throw fuel on it. 
And from our perspective, when uh, a, an individual is exposed to porn and they are a survivor of childhood trauma, particularly sexual uh, abuse trauma, it can take that small flame and turn it into an enormous flame. And, uh, and if they're using uh, porn to cope with that trauma, trauma, it can really make that porn use compulsive and it becomes their go-to coping mechanism uh, to deal with that trauma. Or conversely, if a, a child's uh, dealing with trauma, uh, particularly a think a young teen, mm -hmm. if they're exposed to porn, it can actually be the flame or fire, uh, or sorry, the flame or fuel that takes them from their trauma to actually perpetrating mm -hmm. on another. It can introduce the uh, craving or desire to go perpetrate against another. And so porn plays a key role in child sexual abuse in that it can be a major fuel to that, that fire that's burning from that early childhood trauma. Yeah, just to reiterate kind of what you said, there's a theory out there and it's a it's a famous theory by a famous psychologist and it's the social learning theory and it suggests that new behavior can be adopted by simply observing and imitating others. And so why I bring that up is because you said that porn consumption can lead the consumer to acting out in ways that he or she wouldn't have beforehand. And so again, that's to say that porn consumption can correlate to a, a consumer's behavior. So, yeah. And I think it's really important for listeners to know that most porn consumers do not sexually abuse children, but it's rare that, uh, an individual that sexually abuses children is not a porn consumer. Yeah. That's an important clarification. Thank you for sharing that. So, as you've worked with women through their trauma and they've expressed that porn was involved in their abuse, can you talk to some specific examples of how it was used or how it was involved in their abuse? Yeah, definitely. I, I think it, I, I should probably start with a couple of statistics. So, just let these statistics sink in and then get specific. So 59% of U.S. teens have experienced at least one form of abusive online behavior. And that typically involves some sort of sexually explicit materials being passed, whether that's amongst themselves, such as sharing nudes, or whether it's one person sharing sexually explicit materials with another. 93% of re reported online perpetrators request images from a child or a young person. So, would you repeat on, that, that again? I didn't, it didn't yeah. register for me. 93% of reported online perpetrators request images from a child or young person. Okay. So, you know, you see another connection to porn there that those that are perpetrating. Are, are seeking out child porn specifically mm -hmm. at, a, at a high level in terms of online perpetrators. Mm -hmm. um, think about, I could go on and on, I'll show just a couple more, just because I think it really is a, a salient point, but of adolescents that are abused online, 71.9% of them had sent a nude of themselves the preceding year. Okay. So you see all these interconnections between porn the use of porn to facilitate perpetration or porn um, being a part of the perpetration itself. Or even if we categorize something as sending nudes as not pornographic, um, the fact that a, a nude of a, an adolescent or a child is being shared as part of perpetration shows the connection between porn and child sexual abuse. Right. It's very rare nowadays that sexual abuse does not include some sort of digital interaction. Yeah. Wow. Some of those stats leave me speechless, you know. I know these things exist, but once you start hearing these stats, it's like, goodness gracious. Yeah. It's, it's, 
it's really it, it's it's disturbing when we first hear it and it should be mm-hmm. um, but what we have to do as a society and part of societal change is accept that there's a problem take our focus off of it being disturbing and say okay how are we going to deal with this what can we do we are not powerless there are things we can do to reduce the risk for our children and we need to focus on the solutions and in those solutions frankly is a lot of hope right it's not all bad news i mean the stats are horrific but the Uh, the fact that the stats exist i guess it's good news you know because the research is being done so that we can move forward Exactly. It's all part of the equation. And we're not going to celebrate ever how many kids are being abused in America, but we are going to celebrate the fact that research is exposing it. Mm -hmm. Society is starting to accept it and that we have solutions to actually implement that can make a difference. Right. Yeah. I think one of the common responses to hearing about the truth, like the the eye-opening stats that we cover is like a fear induced paralysis where it's like, goodness, you kind of just want to shut down and be like, is this really the world we live in? But I I appreciate that you have acknowledged that and then encouraged us and the listeners to get past that and be part of the solution. Yeah. And I, I think part of the solution starts with, with your organization and ours. I mean, you think about the combined resources that are on your website and our website, which is sapria.org, spelled S-A-P-R-E-A. There is amazing resources for parents to engage with. There's amazing resources for youth to engage with that can actually move the needle on this problem. And the cool thing is they're free. Yeah, we'll definitely include links in the episode notes so that our listeners can easily access your website to, you know, learn more about Sapria and what you're up to. We've kind of talked already about some of the long-term symptoms of trauma. We haven't talked as much about some of the short-term symptoms of trauma. Because you and the organization have worked with so many individuals that have experienced this and then worked through it, I'm wondering if you can speak a little bit more to some of the shorter term symptoms of trauma. And I think that by doing this, it will help us as listeners to be more aware of our surroundings, our circles, so that we can be a safer space for when people do experience the abuse, they have someone to open up to, right? We can just, we can identify some of the, those telltale signs. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. And thanks for bringing this up. So here's the, here's the diff- the most difficult thing for, for parents in particular uh, with short term symptoms is there the, the, the physical or behavioral symptoms of a child being sexually abused can be explained away by a lot of other factors in life, puberty, and the hormone changes that go on there, uh, st- er, stage development and early childhood development. Hey, they're just going through a stage. Right. It, what what parents need to know about the signs. So I'll, I'll just give you a simple example. Um, a babysitter comes over, and your child is scared. That could be. Hey, there's some attachment things. The child doesn't want mom and dad to leave that, that, you know, that's a normal development issue. It also could be that's that babysitter is sexually abusing your child. So the key for parents isn't to automatically go from zero to my child's being sexually abused when they see an erratic behavior. The key is for parents to notice these are these behaviors that seem off or odd and to dig a little deeper. Um, and not when I say dig, I'm not saying like sit the kid, the child down and just grill them that actually, if they're being abused could probably do more harm, Mm -hmm. but to, um, elevate their, um, their radar to what's going on around that child's life. And are there other signs that they see? So for example, with the teen, uh, straight A student doing great, knocking it out of the park, all of a sudden motivation dives 
no longer getting good grades, don't, doesn't want to hang out with friends. That could be a hormone shift as a result of puberty. Right. It could also be that they were sexually assaulted. Yeah. And, and so the key is for the parent to um, make it a safe place to open dialogue with the child, give the child the words to say what's happening to them. And this is why we emphasize so much discussions around sexual health between parents and children, so that when those moments come, the parent can quickly uh, and dec decisively discern, is my child going through some sort of normal development cycle or is my child being abused? I, I will give a couple of uh, answers to your question that are a little more tangible. So. You talk about short-term impacts. A child who is sexually abused is 40% more likely to drop out of school. So you think about the impact that has long-term, but, but you know, even just the short-term impact, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. They're more likely to isolate, which is something you brought up earlier. Yeah. They show, um, they show uh, behaviors when people are around them that make them uncomfortable that are out of the norm or out of their normal cycle. Those are some of the short-term impacts that parents you know, should be aware of and can pay attention to. Right, that makes sense. If you've enjoyed listening to Consider Before Consuming, consider making a one-time or recurring donation to support the podcast. Your contribution, whatever the amount, helps support our efforts to educate individuals on the impacts of pornography. Help keep this podcast going by donating to Consider Before Consuming today at ftnd.org forward slash support. That's ftnd.org forward slash support. Thank you for sharing some of those. Speaking to how we as parents and caregivers can protect our kids, help them be safer, both in the real world and online Speaking to the online portion, are, do you have any softwares or services that you partner with or recommend that can help us as parents and caregivers keep our kids safer online? No, not necessarily. We we have some um, some partners that have solutions, but we don't uh, actively promote the solutions. What we actively promote is education for parents for them to learn how to make those choices. So rather than say, hey, use this website or this filter or this phone, um, we encourage parents to take control of their child's development and where the risks are. Uh, let me give you an example. We do have a partner, they're actually in the same building of us, Gab Wireless. They have a great first phone technology. Uh, uh, we aren't necessarily gonna say, hey parents, that's the only phone you should use it's a great, great option. Um, but what we are going to do instead is say, hey, parents, um, managing technology is really, really important. Mm -hmm. You need to learn what are the risks of technology and how to manage that with your child. And that's true whether you give them a full smartphone with all its capabilities or you give them a phone like a Gab phone that has uh, – only the necessary capabilities for that child to communicate right. uh, in in a, in a meaningful way. Both are great solutions. The key is that the parent engages. Yeah, yeah. Nothing, no software should replace a healthy relationship, or it can't replace a healthy relationship or healthy conversations. Exactly. Speaking of relationships and conversations between caregivers, parents, and children. We at Fight the New Drug, we encourage parents and caregivers to talk to their kids about pornography early and ideally before the first time exposure. And one of the reasons why is because it, again, helps them be more competent to be able to navigate the situations when they are exposed to pornography. And I'm just wondering if you can talk to or give some advice about how us as parents and caregivers can talk to our kids about intimacy healthy sex, and also the harmful effects of pornography. Like, what is what should that look like? Yeah, this is an awesome question. This is an area, again, where we as, uh, as organizations are lockstep with one another. Discussing sexual development in age-appropriate ways, but early in age-appropriate ways, is essential to reducing the risk that our child will be sexually abused mm -hmm. 
and reducing the risk that a child will abuse another. So we have five factors uh, that we encourage parents to follow to reduce the risk of sexual abuse and discuss sexual development is one of those five. So I'm going to highlight, uh, I'm, I'm going to use a story to make the point, and then I'll answer your question specifically of how parents can tackle it. So okay. um, my now 21-year-old daughter uh, was in sixth grade, and she came home, and I had come home from work, and I was um, putting some things away in my closet, and she walks in and says, Dad, what does the word prostitute mean? I know it has something to do with sex. And she said, I heard it on the playground today. Sixth grade. Okay. Mm -hmm. So just put that into context. Like 12 and, or 11. Yeah. And, and think about how abnormal that conversation is in a good way. Abnormal. Sixth grade girl asking her dad a question about sex. Specifically a word that she knows has to do with sex. Mm -hmm. The only reason that happened is because we had had hundreds of conversations, age-appropriate conversations with her before that. Yeah. And consider the alternative. If she went and Googled the word prostitute. That would she, be a bad scenario. That's a very bad scenario, right? She is going to end up on all sorts of porn or at least high-risk sites. Right. As a sixth-grade girl. And so the fact that the lines of communication were open allowed me as a parent to educate her in an environment that didn't, that did not use shame to discuss sexual development. And it allowed me to help give her accurate information rather than her seeking it through Google or her friends or some other place, because she will get an answer to her question. That's something we know about kids. Yeah. Yeah. And we want that to be with parents. So that's why this principle is so, so critical. And so how do you do it? Um, this is probably too long of an answer that isn't really conducive to a podcast. So I'm going to give a small part of it and then reference uh, some resources on our website. Okay. So we, we divide uh, children into age groups. And we provide very specific resources of what you talk about as it relates to sexual development at each age. For example, in those youngest toddler years, you're talking about the body, bodily autonomy. Uh, you're talking about boundaries. And this can backfire on you. One other quick story. My uh, youngest daughter, she climbs up on the counter when she's about three years old. And we're like, you need to get off the counter. And she's like, no, it's my body and I'm in charge. Yeah. Right? So that's a, that's a good thing. <laughs> it's a great thing. Yeah, that's awesome. Right? It's a great thing. Why was she saying that? Because she was starting to digest our discussions around bodily autonomy. I love that. We're, we're, not, we're not talking about sexual intercourse with a three-year-old. That's not necessary or, or age appropriate. But by the time our kids turn age eight, we're having extensive discussions about porn and we're giving them the basic discussion about sexual intercourse. We're having what many people refer to as the big talk. But the key for parents to understand is if all you do is the big talk, it's not going to be su sufficient. It's all the little talks in between. It, it, it's discussing bodily autonomy and boundaries and, and why we respect our, our sibling when they say no. All those preparation discussions and then the, the after discussions of the big talk of, hey, you're about to hit puberty and here's what's going to change and, and you're about to go dating and you know your first year of dating is when you're most at risk for sexual assault. So let's talk about dating safety and da, 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 right? You kind of get the idea. Yeah. It has to be a continuous conversation. It can't be, oh, I, I did the big talk. We're good. Check that box. Move on. It has to be continuous dialogue. And the last thing I'll say on it is this. Uh, I speak regularly, and so I, I keep track of how many dialogue opportunities I have with my kids for two weeks up, up before a speaking engagement. I had one just this last weekend. I, had, I, I counted 15 separate, in a two-week period, opportunities to talk about healthy sexual development in that two-week period. Wow. Yeah, that 15. shows how many we should be having. Yep, exactly. That. Thank you for sharing. That was like, it was a great answer and such good insight. I think the most beautiful thing that I pulled from it is 
the the fact that you have had hundreds of conversations and that facilitated the level of intimacy for your sixth grade daughter to come home and ask you the question. Yep. And I've yep. got five more stories like that I could tell, but the, <laughs> it, it's it's awesome. It works. Right. What are the resources you were going to mention? Oh, so yeah, at sapria.org under under our prevention section, you're going to find as one of the main sections under there uh, talking about healthy sexual development as a key risk reducer. So if if people go on that part of the website, they're going to find a lot of good content materials, educational materials about how to talk to their kids about sex and make it easier. But also those specific resources I was mentioning that says, what do we talk about at each age? So, you know, as your listeners drill down there, we, we're going to make it easier for them. They have to do the work. They have to have the conversations. They have to embrace the awkward that can sometimes be there when you start that conversation. But we're going to make it easier for you to have that dialogue. And we even have some resources that they can consume with their children to help fil- facilitate dialogue. Okay, great. We'll make sure to include those in the episode notes. Awesome. I think one of the cool things about hearing from you is that or at least one of the hopes that I have is that our listeners can walk away from this episode with increased empathy for the for our kids, for the kids that we care for. And I think that education and awareness can be one of the tools that allows us to have increased empathy. Because if we don't know that the problem exists, the empathy really can't exist either, right? That's right. And, you know, a big part of that empathy is when we as parents recognize that we all grew up with, with porn and sexual abuse of some form, but both are intensifying. And what our children are facing and battling is extremely difficult. Yeah. And our empathy should lead to action Uh, in the sense that we need to empower them with the tools, right? We need to feel for what they're experiencing, feel for how difficult it is. We need to have that part of the empathy. But the empathy that leads to action is just as critical. It says, I'm the parent here. I'm the adult. And I need to empower my children to be successful in this world they're living in. Yeah, I love that. We've already talked to this a little bit, Chris, but I'm wondering if you can talk to it a little bit more Because when we talk about sexual abuse, oftentimes our mind goes to physical sexual abuse. And I'm just wondering if you can talk to a little bit more about the forms of, like the non-contact forms of sexual abuse um, and give some more examples of what that might look like. Yeah, at the highest level, you can put it in a a few categories. Uh, You have voyeurism. So that's where someone... forces uh, themselves on you. Maybe you're walking by them and they expose themselves to you. Uh, that That's not as common, but does happen. And we consider that a form of sexual abuse. Uh, another form would be uh, sexting. And uh, sexting certainly can be consensual, but when it comes to minors, uh, sharing sexually explicit materials uh, is uh, not only illegal, Um, but can do a lot of harm. So you have that aspect of it. Um, Then you also have uh, using sexually explicit content as a way to groom for physical abuse. So that occurs quite a bit when uh, a perpetrator is grooming a child or a teen for abuse as they purposely expose them to sexually explicit materials. Uh, usually in a digital way. Uh, The last one I kind of highlight is one that's growing right now and and catching some attention, and that is sextortion, where uh, maybe maybe a nude was shared in a consensual way, and albeit that that, that's not ideal, then the individual on the other side uses that, uh, the threat of uh, exposing that nude to broad audiences to extort what they want out of the the individual on the other side. So all those are really, really, I'd say, solid examples of sexual abuse that doesn't necessarily require a physical touch. And the thing that uh, your listeners uh, should understand 
is from a clinical s- standpoint, it can have just as much of a traumatic impact as the physical touch forms of sexual abuse. It can be just as devastating. It can drive just as much shame. It can lead into just as much post-traumatic stress. So, you know, some people like to get really picky as they research sexual abuse and say, hey, we should only count it when it, it involves touch. But from a an impact on the survivor side, there's really not a huge difference between sexual abuse that involves touch and sexual abuse that uh, is uh, uh, absent of that touch, but 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 still causes the harm. Right. Yeah, there's a lot of ways to define trauma. Um, one of the ways to define trauma is how, kind of how our body responds, the, the systems within our body, how it responds to something. And so I can totally understand how whether it's physical or non-physical, the systems within our body can respond in very similar ways. Exactly. And, you know, some people that are sexually abused in a physical way don't develop post-traumatic stress. Mm -hmm. Some people that are sexually abused in a digital way do develop post-traumatic stress. So the, the response and the lasting impacts depend on a lot of factors beyond the incident itself. I think the key is to recognize that it is that individual experience and how they process what happened more defines whether there's traumatic impacts than than the nature of the event. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that makes sense. So as we're speaking about the online forms or the non-physical forms of sexual abuse, you mentioned that there has been an increase in regards to sextortion. And I'm just wondering if you can, if there's like empirical work or any type of research out there that shows that there is an increase in not only sextortion, but the other forms you mentioned, like in the recent past, has there been an increase in these forms of sexual abuse? Um, So I don't have a really good stat in front of me to give you the statistical uh, answer that question. Um, I could probably track it down, but let me give you some other information that helps make sense of it. So when it comes to sextortion, the key for sextortion is the ability for the person that's extorting to be able to spread it to a broad-based audience. And you have to have digital means to do that, to actually hold the threat over the individual. Right. Of course, you could have sextortion in 1983 where uh, there was you know, a Polaroid nude that says, you know, and the person says, I'm going to share this amongst the school. But the the scale of the impact for someone that says, hey, I've got this nude of you and I'm going to upload it to the site that's going to be viewed by millions of people is both are horrific. But but our ability based on today's technology to extort someone that way is greater. And that's why we're seeing a rise. You're also seeing a rise um, in the media's attention to it. Uh, So awareness that it goes on is growing as well. Yeah. It it comes down to the technology has changed so drastically. And so that's, that's changed everything. Yeah. I'll share, I will share a couple of stats. I think they're related. Uh, Here's one. 90% of teens believe online harassment and sextortion could be part of that is a problem among their peers. Wow. So it, most teens see this online harassment uh, whether it's you know cyberbullying all the way to sextortion as a problem among their peers, mm-hmm. uh, then you take in uh, into consideration the stat of of nudes, which I shared some earlier, and here's one more uh, of adolescents abused online. Seventy one point nine percent have sent a nude of themselves the preceding year. Yeah, that shows. So you see how they're. They're correlated and interacting with one another. Right. You mentioned how awareness is part of the solution. And I'm just curious if you can speak to other ways that we can fight this issue of child sexual abuse, both physical and non-physical. Yeah, the key ingredients to fighting a societal issue like this, uh, I always like to divide it into three three key ingredients. The first is the awareness that we've already talked about. The second is the positive peer pressure. 
and you might say this is part of awareness, but I, I separate it out on purpose. What the positive peer pressure is, is the neighbor talking to their neighbor about an issue and saying, hey, I'm doing something about this. What are you doing? Yeah. Or the you know two coworkers at lunch saying, hey, this thing's going on at my kid's school. This is what we're doing to intervene. Do you have any advice? That positive peer pressure is extremely important to bring about societal change and fight an issue like abuse. And then the third piece is once people are aware of it, whether it's through that grassroots positive peer pressure or a huge media awareness campaign, do we give parents somewhere to go to, to act on it? Yeah. And, and that's where the educational resources are so critical. So all the other things that go on, think policy work and legislation, uh, educating in schools, uh, educating in um, uh, healthcare communities, all of those things that surround the home are very valuable if mom and or dad are engaged in home at home in the topic. Mm -hmm. If mom or dad are not engaged in at the home, those other peripherals will never move the needle. You can't legislate your way out of this problem. Right. So we have to give mom and dad the educational resources to not only learn how to reduce the risk that their child will be abused or abuse another, but make them accessible and easy for them to implement so they can have those hundreds, thousands of conversations during the the growing up years of their child. Right. That's how we move the needle. Then all those peripherals, the legislation, the education system, the healthcare systems, all the work they're doing to address sexual abuse become very powerful support systems to that home. But the key is to get to mom and dad with that educational material. So awareness, broad-based awareness, you know, whether through social media, mainstream media, whatever, that positive peer pressure, and then we've got to have the educational materials ready to go when mom and dad say, oh, this is something I need to pay attention to. What, what do I do? Right. And, and that, that, those are the three ingredients to moving the needle and fighting child sexual abuse. Those are great ingredients. We've had to cover some, you know, heavy things as we talk about this, as we come to the realization of what the current landscape is, it can be a heavy thing and it can cause us to feel like down and discouraged. And so it's good to have those, those three things that we can do to move the needle, to be part of the solution. Yeah, we've got to take pack back our power as parents on this issue and, and, and as collective parents as a society. The great news and the positive is once we get over that initial lump in our stomach, yeah. is we can do something. We have the tools we need to actually make a difference yeah. in our home and in our immediate communities. Right. And everybody doing their part collectively coming together one neighborhood at a time, one parent at a time, one household at a time, one school at a time creates a societal change. Right. So we don't have to just sit with that pit in our stomach and say, hey, this is horrible and I wish it weren't so. Even if that's true, we can quickly turn that to, hey, I I'm a little bent about this. I'm a little angry about this. This is horrible. This pit in my stomach. I'm going to do something about it in my sphere of influence and I have the resources to do it. Right. Yeah. That's a beautiful thing. Well, speaking of the hopeful side, I'm wondering if you can share with us some one or two success stories of women who have benefited from Sapria's help. Yeah, I'd be happy to. I want to, I want to share a, a prevention success story and then a healing success story, if that's okay. Right. Um, the prevention success story, I'm going to go close to home um, just because I have a better lens there. And I'm going to talk about my 21-year-old daughter. This is that same daughter that had the, the prostitute conversation. Mm -hmm. She was on a dating website in her first year of college and got propositioned on that dating website to hook up with somebody. And... Um, he, she had never met this guy, um, but but his 
his his first request was to hook up with her. And in that dating environment, in that first year of college, which is a high risk period for sexual assault, an empowered individual can keep themselves safe. So she's a little snarky. You have to understand that and snarky in a good way. So <laughs> she, she, she did a choose your own adventure because along with the hook hookup, he at least offered ice cream. Right. So, uh, she, so she said, you can, you can, you can ch- choose one of these three things. The first thing she offered up is she said, you can engage with me over ice cream and that's it. Right. Mm-hmm. The second one is she offered up was, uh, my dad is involved in a foundation that reduces the risk of sexual abuse. So for me to hook up with you would be a high risk behavior. <laughs> nice. And then the third option she said was how many girls has this worked on? Right. So a little choose your own adventure. <laughs> Obviously she was being a little snarky. She was never going to meet up with this guy. Right. Right. But she, she kind of put it back at him and he chose option three and said, you know, went into a little bit of a sob story of how he'd never done this before. And, you know, he'd just broken up with his girlfriend. But the, the point being is you think about a college age girl might be a little lonely, um, in her first year of college Someone says, hey, do you want to grab ice cream and hook up? If she says yes, the risk that she'll be sexually assaulted is pretty high. Yeah. Um, but because of those thousands of conversations, she knew how to deal with that situation. Right. She knew how to deal with it so well that she even felt like she could be a little snarky with it. <laughs> For sure. Right? Yep. And, and so that, that's, a, that's an example of, tw- uh, well, in this case, she was 18 at the time. So 18 years worth of work. Yeah, came to fruition in that moment. That's and there are a lot of wins before that, but I use it to highlight a success story for prevention. Yeah. Kudos to you as a parent and to your daughter for the level of competence that she has. It's so cool. Yeah. And, and I'm going to give her the credit, right? Because we as parents provide the tools. We work hard. We do our part. But she chose to accept it, right? Yeah. She And she chose to engage in those tools. Let me share an example on the healing side. We had a, a woman come to us by the name of Fire. She was really in a, a rough spot. In, in her words, she described it this way. She said, my life was hell. She had struggled in her career, had struggled with some relationships, uh, was really down in her life. She uh, engaged in one of our healing services and we got to engage with her for four years after that um, in, in various ways. And she tells her story four years later about what, what we refer to as her post-traumatic growth. And her post-traumatic growth looked like this. In those four years, she returned to school and finished her nursing degree and was now practicing as a hospice nurse. She was able to get married and enter a healthy relationship, and she had a healthy relationship. She was able to re-engage in her faith, which was important to her. She was able to um, not only get married, but uh, two weeks after we had had this dialogue, or before we had had this dialogue with her, she had her first child. Okay. So her life went from complete shambles in four, little over four years from complete shambles to college graduate, contributing to society productively as a nurse, in a healthy relationship, and fulfilling her desire to be a mom. And um, that's post-traumatic growth. Wow. And I'm going to use her words. So she participated in what we refer to as our retreat program. Uh, she said... None of this would have happened if it wasn't for the retreat. Wow. What a beautiful thing. That's, that's what we, that's what 37% reduction in post-traumatic stress, post-traumatic stress and 45% increase in well-being. That's what it equates to. That's post-traumatic growth. Wow. I love that. One of my favorite phrases in life is that moments of bliss are not free. And 
Fire. Her name's Fire, you said? Yep. Fire, she paid the price, and she she did the work to make that happen, and that's an amazing feat. Yeah, super cool. We didn't heal her. We don't heal people. Uh, we give them the tools. We empower them with what they need. They do the hard work, and, and yeah. that's healing. Right. You're just there to facilitate the healing, but they have to do it, right? Yep. Wow. What a beautiful thing. Well, you mentioned your healing services. You mentioned your, your retreat program. I'm wondering if you can speak to the application process in case some of our listeners want to apply or participate in some of your services. Yeah, definitely. So uh, one of the keys with our application process is we, we, we do uh, a process that helps the individual decide whether the retreat is right for them. Uh, because individuals with sexual abuse can be at different stages in their healing. And the stage that we support is the long-term recovery from the post-traumatic stress. So for individuals that are dealing more with acute issues or they're just trying to stabilize, mm -hmm. we're probably not the right fit for them. But if they, they're stable, meaning uh, they're living life day to day, but they're dealing with the impacts of post-traumatic stress, then our processes or our, our services are, are perfect for them if they're ready to deal with that long-term post-traumatic stress. Mm -hmm. And so uh, they go right onto our website at sapria.org and it's very easy to find because we, we carve things out by healing versus prevention versus some other things. And under healing, they're going to have the uh, a section called the Supria Retreat. They go and fill out a very simple form, and that triggers our intake team to start the intake process, which includes an application. That application uh, asks uh, pretty typical questions around physical and mental health. Not, not a whole lot different than what you might fill out if you went to a doctor's office. And then from there, uh, we, as we assess the responses. In some cases, if we have questions, we'll set up a screening call with one of our clinicians. If uh, we don't have any questions, then we'll uh, shift them right into our retreat selection process. So they get to choose from uh, certain dates in either our Utah or Georgia locations. And then uh, once they've locked that in, then uh, we, we get them the packet and everything that they need to prepare uh, for that date to start the retreat. So it's a, a relatively simple process. For some, it, it takes a little time to work through because they, you know, they experience anxiety around it and we're willing to go through that journey with them. But uh, we're ready when you're ready is my, uh, my, my message to anybody that's a survivor of child sexual abuse that's an adult woman who was abused as, as a child. We're ready when you're ready. And for the men out there, um, we're working to be ready for you, and we will be ready in the future. That's great. What can our listeners do to support Supriya? You know, like, like anything, it's not a whole lot different than uh, the support you need to fight the new drug. We need people's megaphone, uh, people that are willing to use their megaphone to get the message out. And just like you're doing today for us, the fact that you're hosting us on this podcast is using your megaphone to get our message out. And um, that's huge. That's huge for us. And I'm very grateful that you would do it. So we need people's megaphone. We need people that are willing to volunteer. There's all sorts of volunteer opportunities. And we need funding. And I'd venture to guess that Fight the New Drug needs the same three things. Right. Yep. Go. I think every nonprofit probably needs those three things. <laughs> yep. So awesome. Well... Again, we'll include the links in the episode notes for the listeners that want to learn more about trauma and, and navigate that whole process of applying to retreats and other services you have. So we'll make sure to do that. I want to leave you with the opportunity to have the last word during this conversation. Is there anything on your heart or mind that you'd like to share? I, I think I just want to reiterate something I've already shared, and that is there's, there's horror when it comes to sexual abuse. But it's not all horror. Uh, there's, like anything in this world, there, there's the opposite side, and that's hope. And uh, there is a lot of hope around the issue of sexual abuse. Help 
us hashtag stop the demand for pornography and sexual exploitation. This July, during our hashtag stop the demand campaign, you can support our efforts to create and share educational resources that educate individuals on how the porn industry fuels the demand for exploitation, sex trafficking, objectification, and more. Plus, when you donate $50 or more during the month of July, we'll give you an exclusive Stop the Demand tote as a free gift. Donate today at ftnd.org forward slash donate. That's ftnd.org forward slash donate. Thanks for joining us on this episode of Consider Before Consuming. Consider Before Consuming is brought to you by Fight the New Drug. Fight the New Drug is a non-religious and non-legislative organization that exists to provide individuals the opportunity to make an informed decision regarding pornography by raising awareness on its harmful effects, using only science, facts, and personal accounts. If you'd like to learn more about today's guest and the conversation we had, you can check out the links included with this episode. If you've enjoyed listening to Consider Before Consuming, consider subscribing to the podcast and leaving a review. Again, big thanks to you for listening to this conversation. As you go about your day, we invite you to increase your self-awareness, look both ways, check your blind spots, and consider before consuming.